For me, it is a great pleasure to share this section. I am Antonella Petrillo and I am professor at the University of Napoli Partenope in Italy. And uh, this is the second year that I am sure that's on um, the section digital manufacture toward the industry 5.0. It is a uh, um, potential title, provocatory title, but uh, I like it and so I propose this, uh, this name and um, during the session we will have uh, the opportunity to, to uh, analyze some interesting tools and uh, to be used in smart manufacturing uh, including uh, additive manufacturing, mixing reality, and um, we will have the opportunity to see uh, an interesting model developed in Argentina uh, to evaluate the level of technological development in manufacturing um, industry, and we have the opportunity to uh, see uh, a nice software, architecture software developed in Italy, in uh, Polimi, Politecnico Milano. And uh, this is uh, a very a nice session because we have a uh, uh, representation from Germany, Austria, Argentina and Italy. And so if we will uh, have, if we are ready, we can check. Yes, exactly. Ah, OK, OK. Uh, you can on your uh, camera. And uh, the, the second presentation is on, uh, the title is Investigating the Potential of Smart Manufacturing Technologies. Uh, the presenter is Jan Janisek from Austria. And uh, if you are ready, we can start with your presentation. Pay attention to your time, please. <laughs> Perfect, OK, I try to. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. I hope uh, everybody can understand me. Just a little yes. check up. Perfect. Yes. Okay, thanks a lot. So um, what I'm talking about is our investigation concerning the potential of smart manufacturing technologies. Very broad topic and somehow connected to the last talk. So I hope I did not I do not repeat any contents, but I think I can dive a little bit more into the deep of deeps of uh, predictive maintenance. So uh, what I, uh, um, let me say, our co and our colleagues are working on is a project called Smart Factory Lab, which is a technology lab for smart production on the product life cycle uh, concerning three major topics, uh, which are namely predictive maintenance, which I'm focusing in, on in this talk, mixed reality and additive manufacturing. For this project, we had quite a bunch of roughly 2 million euros. Uh, so we could afford some uh, infrastructure extensions like a high-performance computing cluster at the Campus Hagenberg at the University of Applied Sciences in Upper Austria, AR and VR technology for the Campus Steyr, and a laser deposition welding system from DMG Mori for the Campus of Wales. And we were supposed to work with these new tools and gadgets to uh, cover quite a lot of use cases and scientific publications. We did about 30 scientific uh, publications, which is quite a lot for only us, for only three of us, which are uh, concerned with the uh, research activities. And we performed uh, several use cases together with our corporate partners, namely DMG Mori, the creator of the welding system, or um, from the field of glass manufacturing, Internorm and Lisek, or Bosch Rexroth, just as uh, just as Marcos um, also had in the list in the presentation before. So what we're doing in this paper actually summer is uh, we summarize our experiences gathered over the last six years and condense them to, uh, let me say, a guideline for future smart manufacturing projects. So it is not really about a single enhanced technologic technology or methodology but it is um, considering expert interviews and feedback given from our corporate partners condensed to, uh, as I said before, to some kind of a, a guideline paper. So what we tried to answer in this paper was what did work in our project for all of us, 
uh, what are the connections in between those uh, three topics, what did not work and why did it not work, and first and most forward, foremost, what are the key challenges for future projects. So what I'm focusing on and I'm concentrating on, um, not just in this talk, but also in the project at itself, is predictive maintenance, which means the illusion of industrial maintenance originating in uh, corrective maintenance, meaning you fix something when it breaks, very conventional preventive maintenance, which is in action in every field of uh, industry right now, where you perform maintenance tasks um, on a fixed schedule basis just to um, prevent the eventuality of a breakdown. And what we try to do is the implementation of the idea of predictive maintenance, which basically means we try to uh, forecast optimal points in time for, maintain for certain maintenance tasks. And the key point is we use the actual condition uh, of a machinery we want, to, um, we want to maintain. And therefore, we monitor this system continuously and analyze uh, the data continuously using as the speaker before me said, physical models or machine learning models, we in this um, uh, in this project actually concentrate on so-called white box machine learning models. So what we experienced in our use cases is that um, predictive maintenance is conceived to be a topic which actually is solved already. Also, the Gartner hype cycle, as we can see it here, um, tries to, to highlight uh, predictive maintenance as part of predictive, predictive analytics as something which is actually ready for productivity. Now, interestingly, the enabling technologies, just as the Internet of Things or machine learning, um, are technologies which are listed by Gartner in 2015 to be ready five up to ten years. So that is the first bias um, we were experiencing also um, in our use cases because on a certain level in um, company management, let me say, it is conceived to be already ready, to be already a product off the shelf. However, what we experienced in our use cases when we brought the topic to reality, when we tried to deploy our machine learning models, is that isn't the case. It needs more time, it needs more research. So what we usually do in our, in our use cases is the following. This is, this is also called uh, CRISPR-DM. This is a certain uh, model for uh, data analytics workflow. First step is always data acquisition. So we use process data, sensor data, uh, product quality data, which we get from our customers. Our customers are usually the developers of production machinery, so we do not get the data from them. We get the data from their customers, actually, who use the machine, which is, as you might acknowledge, a very, very cumbersome task right at the beginning of such projects, and which hampers the development of a real world predictive maintenance impl implementation. Second step is pre processing. Just as in any data analytics case, um, use case, you have to consolidate, filter, aggregate the data until you get a dense, clean data stream, which you can model with the bespoken machine learning models, model te modeling techniques, just as linear regression or symbolic regression, which is which are white box modeling techniques, or random forests or uh, artificial neural networks. What do you get out of that? Are machine learning models. You do that until you have a, a sufficient result in a so-called offline phase. When online phase, you take the live data coming in, running through your pre-processing pipeline, and you evaluate the pre-processed data with your pre-built machine learning models to do, for example, a drift prediction, meaning to predict if the system is in a stable, normal behavior, or if it's drifting already, meaning that maintenance task might be necessary. So this is the very basic form of predictive maintenance. You drift, uh, you predict if the system is in a normal, healthy state or if it's going towards erroneous. Now, what we did, for example, in this use case was um, 
we created a, a lab factory to implement predictive maintenance, meaning that we did not took a live system, but we re, we uh, simulated a little part of a uh, of a production plant uh, and set up a lab factory to enforce the wearing of so-called fan impellers, which are used by uh, which are produced by the company Scheuch and used for de-dusting great production plants. So what you can see here is a sample fan with the impeller inside, and this is the setup we created here. We have here um, the fan, and then we have a uh, certain pipe system where dust and sand is um, put through to enforce and to fasten the uh, wearing of fan impellers. So we came up with um, a two-phase approach to do so. We first, in the first phase, we uh, created a variety of um, system models which detect if vibration signals are uh, linked to a new impeller or are linked to uh, worn impellers, just as uh, these here on the pictures. Um, of course, a variety, uh, a great variety of differently shaped uh, worn imp uh, impellers are possible. In the second step, we modeled the raw sensor signals to be able to forecast them. And in the online phase, we use those uh, forecasting models to forecast the raw vibration signals, uh, for which we applied in the fourth and last step, the pre-built state models from the first step in order to predict now if a forecasted signal is already in a drifting behavior or still in a normal uh, in a normal state. And what we achieved here and detailed also in the paper listed here on the bottom uh, is that we could estimate the condition progress um, roughly 50 iterations uh, before the actual uh, before we recorded it in the actual progress uh, wearing progress. So this worked quite well, but what we now wanted to highlight in this paper is that you should be aware of the lab situation anytime you read something in literature like this. There are a lot of challenges which are eradicated in such lab situations in which are prominently uh, published and of course are a great success for science, but real world comes up with a lot of additional challenges, just as data preparation, as in any data analytics use case, you as a data scientist have an application area reaching from uh, data acquisition to the evaluation part, and your actual research focus is uh, most probably just the modeling and the evaluation part. However, time you spend is quite biased, meaning Mostly in our use cases, we have to put our effort 80% at least on the pre-processing and data acquisition part. So not the sensor mounting part, but to get all the available data resources our customer has and not on our actual research focus, the modeling, the machine learning modeling part. And such typical data science um, data analytics uh, challenges uh, are also valid of course for predictive maintenance use cases however in this paper we wanted to highlight those especially which are very specific for predictive maintenance and one of the most important one is the goal definition as i've said before uh, in the very use case i just presented the first step actually was to detect uh, concept drifts which are uh, on the rise, meaning that we wanted to predict if our prediction is um, still valid compared to the recorded real value. In the second step, however, the goal was to predict the remaining useful lifetime of such a, a slowly wearing uh, radial fan. And as a third step, not for this use case, but often read in literature, it is assumed that predictive maintenance also stands for automatic maintenance 
scheduling upon those condition-based predictions. And these are key to be defined realistically. Remaining use for lifetime prediction is not easy, and in most of our use cases, it was simply not possible. We were lucky to have some use cases in the last six years where it was possible actually to detect and or predict a concept drift. So a realistic goal definition is key because in the beginning of a project, remaining useful lifetime prediction is something every customer wants to have. But over time, and we address this as a uh, also, also in feasibility analysis, over the time you have to level down your expectations and uh, get to a realistic uh, conclusion. So what we suggest is to do a feasibility analysis in a breach project first to answer questions such as can I actually model normal versus erroneous uh, system behavior uh, with machine learning techniques or physical modeling techniques from the data I have? Can I uh, observe concept drift when I evaluate those models? Is the data provided for our lab situation in the pre-project also available afterwards in the real world environment. Such questions are key to be answered before diving deep into uh, predictive maintenance projects. So what we experienced by now is that most industry are in the middle of digitalizing products and processes. However, still in the middle, not having a full-fledged IoT infrastructure in most of our use cases, we are getting uh, comma separated value files and also handwritten maintenance protocols, which are ne not easy to handle. Therefore, main uh, predictive maintenance is not a off the shelf product. We come to that con conclusion in uh, this paper that it is still a research topic which needs a lot of more time. And just because Gartner says it should be already productive doesn't mean that this is the case in reality, at least for our use cases, for the use cases we experienced. And interesting, inter interestingly, the same thing goes for the topics of my colleagues, augmented reality and additive manufacturing. As an example, AR glasses are having great potential, as we feel, for remote assistance applications or for uh, trainings. However, they are still infeasible for production floor setups. So there is still uh, there are still there are still um, extensions necessary for the hardware. The same goes for the additive manufacturing, where mass production is actually the goal of laser metal metal deposition welding. However, not yet technologically or economically ready. The potential for additive manufacturing, at least in our cases, is there, of course, for coatings, for repair of very expensive products or for a very small batch production. But mass customization is something which is still years away. So to conclude, not just with a negative uh, um, outlook, I wanted to, to provide um, some thoughts on the actual, on the current um, Gartner 2020 hype cycle, where we saw that explainable AI is one of the hottest topics right now. And reaching the plateau of productivity, supposedly in five to 10 years. Well, we have to disagree. We're right now already using such explainable AI methodologies, just as white box models. So they already exist. So this is the positive conclusion uh, I can draw from this uh, from this uh, presentation, and I'll be happy to answer or receive uh, to answer questions or receive comments on the talk I just gave. So thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And um, any question, please raise your hand if uh, there are any questions. Yeah. No questions? 
John, just a curiosity. You sp speak. You spoke about uh, that the ma major technologies are predictive maintenance, additive manufacturing, and um, and uh, uh, argument reality. And then uh, you mentioned also Gartner 2020. But uh, in uh, your opinion and in um, according to your experiences, uh, COVID pandemic will change these priorities. How it would it will it will change these priorities? Well, let me just have a quick look. Well, um, I think it will uh, it will speed up or let me say intensify the interest in um, further um, further speed up those emerging uh, technologies or the application of those uh, technologies. I think in Gartner 2010, uh, you had things like, or let me say 2005, you had things like e-learning here uh, on the chart. So I think digitalization is one uh, big benefit of this crisis, as sad as it sounds. So I see great potential in there, yes. Yes, I agree, I agree with you. Thank you for your uh, clarification. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. great. Uh, so, Jean, um, I have a question regarding the the, um, the, the explainable AI part. Um, so, with respect to uh, neural networks, I, so is so I read a paper wherein uh, they say that the explainable AI with respect to neural networks is still in its infancy stage. But with respect to algorithms like Bayes and uh, other probabilistic algorithms, explainable AI is well advanced. Um, so is that something that you also agree with? Because based on that chart that you showed, it's like it's at its complete infancy. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Exactly. Totally. So the thing is, uh, explainable AI actually just addresses deep learning. And this is actually also what I I probably missed to say here, um, don't trust buzzwords machines such as the Gartner hype cycle. They're throwing a lot of words in on a diagram like explainable I, um, which are, let me say, shortened answers. We already have explainable AI um, with, for example, physical models or statistical models such as Bayesian networks or symbolic regression models as I uh, listed them here. So explainable AI is already something which is possible uh, with the right methods. Deep learning is something from my perspective is intrinsically a black box, meaning making making it explainable is something well probably very worth looking at it, but we already have we should consider that we already have methods which are capable to do so, uh, which are by now in this area not as popular as deep learning since deep learning has so much success in applications such as speech recognition or image recognition. However, for others, other applications such as predictive maintenance, there are suitable methods, as I've said, white box modeling uh, techniques, which are more suitable probably uh, for this type of um, this type of application. OK. Okay, thank you. Thank you again. And if there are no more questions, we can move towards the third presentation. Thanks, Jan. Thank you. The presenter of the third presentation is um, Horacio René Del Giorgio. Are you there, Horacio? Okay. Del Giorgio is. Um, Italian surname. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. The, uh, the, are you Italian origin? I well, uh, I have some some uh, relatives uh, from Italy, but uh, yes, this, this is the father of my grandfather. Okay. Okay. I understand. Uh, mm -hmm. The title of the presentation is Evaluation of Information Communication Technologies Toward Industry 4.0. Uh, 
Please yes. go ahead, Razio. Thank you very much. Uh, do you Take see your the... time, but no more 50 minutes. No, no problem. Do you see the presentation? Yes, very well. Great. Well, first of all, uh, I would like to say that it's a pleasure to participate in ISM 2020 because it's a very prestigious event that has given us the opportunity to project our research work internationally. I would like to thank the ISM 2020 Organization Committee and especially Antonio Padovano from the University of Calabria uh, for all the support he has given us. And I also want to thank Antonella and all my colleagues in this room uh, for the presentations and for being present here. The title of this presentation is uh, Evaluation of Information and Communication Technologies Towards Industry 4.0. Although I'm going to be the speaker, I made this presentation and all the background work with Alicia Mon. And in fact, uh, we are part of an interdisciplinary uh, research group at the National University of La Matanza in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, we already know the advantages of ICTs in the industry uh, and some of them are mentioned in this slide. However, the industries, at least uh, in Argentina, do not seem to be very involved with this philosophy. In this sense, uh, the local industry seems not to have defined strategies for technological updates on which to base the improvement of competitiveness. Uh, since it does not turn to be a demanding sector of software products or incorporation of ICTs in the pr uh, production processes. Um, the problem is that we already know that uh, at present is, uh, this is something that you cannot choose. Uh, you cannot stay in a conservative position because uh, you are left out. Then we saw that it became necessary to have some instrument to know where we are. And this is the problem that we tried to solve by constructing an index that measures the adoption level of ICTs in the industry. As we can read in the slide, uh, the steps for the index construction that we are going to explain in the following uh, consist of define taxonomies for ICTs, define taxonomies for industrial processes. After defining both taxonomies, make a cross between them, then assign a value for each cross, and finally build an index based on these crosses to measure the ICT adoption level in the industries. Now let's talk about the construction of the index. Uh, regarding ICTs, software, hardware and infrastructure are three elements that exist and need each other. Uh, they need to work in an associated way because hardware requires software to work and also a communications platform, in, let's say infrastructure, uh, to be interconnected with the rest. Uh, in these slides, software, hardware, and infrastructure, um, we can see a first level of more details hmm, uh, each of these ta ta taxonomies. In fact, where applicable, there is a second level of details made, uh, based on the terms proposed on the first level. To give an example, in software, for example, we have uh, one of the first level is uh, web technologies. Uh, within these technologies, uh, there is a second level of details such as a web page, intranet, extranet online advertising. Now we change for hardware, it's exactly the same, and it's exactly the same for infrastructure. Regarding uh, industrial processes, uh, these are the industrial processes that we define, uh, and it's management, finance and accounting, engineering, purchases, logistics, production and sales. Uh, in this uh, double entry table, we cross the intersections here are the ICTs, here are the uh, industrial processes. Uh, we cross the intersections in which some type of possible relationship is presumed. The other intersections, the other intersections are grayed out. Uh, once the intersections have been uh, identified, the idea is to assign a weight uh, or value, one, five or ten, to each possible intersection. There are some criteria that we adopted for the evaluation based on internal discussions in the research group that we are later ratified or rectified through the advice of experts on these subjects. Uh, this is the same table as before, 
in which uh, we have changed the crosses with the evaluations. We could be, as already, we say, as already said, one, five, or ten. This is the survey form. Uh, once again, this is the form that has to be filled in each survey industry and it's the same as the previous ones, but the space that previously had the crosses or the values now is blank. Um, in our research work, uh, we detected that uh, for the correct completion of this survey, it's necessary to locate uh, what we call the key informant. The key informant is someone who would have to know all the areas of the company and the technology used in each one of them. Uh, in Argentina, in some cases, uh, this person could be the IT manager, although sometimes he or she may not even belong to the company and could be an external consultant. Here is an example of a survey in a particular industry. Then the crosses are changed with the values of the matrix table. Then all the values are added. All the values are added. And finally, the ICT adoption level of that industry is finally reached. The, the ICT adoption level is just the addition of all those values. Uh, then looking at the table that we see on the slide and depending on the range of values, that surveyed industry will have a basic adoption level, medium or intermediate adoption level and advanced adoption levels. These are the range of the values. It's very important to mention, very important to mention that uh, our index only considers the degree of insertion of ICTs. Uh, we do not get into the detail of the industrial processes. We only consider them to make the cross between ICTs and them. In other words, we are not trying to find an overall level of digitalization. We are a step behind. We are focusing all our efforts only in ICT's side. Well, regarding the instruments, uh, we have a web page in which we share some documents regard related to the creation of the index. There is also the digital version of the survey so that it can also be filled out digitally when face-to-face -face interview is not necessary. There is uh, also available a video presentation of the project. And from this web page, we also intend to make room to provide, as we can read in the slide, a university counseling linking the software industry with manufacturing industry, systematic survey with periodic reports on the evaluation of ICTs in the industry by branch of activity and detection of training needs and job training. Uh, this is uh, the last thing is something that we consider very important. Um, unfortunately, we do not, we have not been able to make uh, much progress uh, during this year due to the pandemic. In fact, we made a formal presentation at the university on March 12th and the next day the pandemic was already declared. Uh, anyway, we were able to make a pilot test with 40 industries uh, between October and December of last year. And the following are some of the results that we are going to show. Uh, we can see that most of the industries uh, have an ICT adoption level between basic and medium. We also found it appropriate to show the distribution of the companies according to their size. As we found in the pilot test, metallurgical industries that had uh, the three ICT adoption levels, basic, medium and advanced, we wanted to analyze them in more detail and check what percentage of basic, medium and advanced ICTs each of them had. And we observed that in general, they contain the highest percentage of the ICTs in their level and the previous ones. For example, basic in medium, we have basic and medium and in advanced, we have basic, medium and advanced. Uh, Although there are also some cases in which they have ICTs of higher levels as well. We were especially struck by the metallurgical company with basic ICT level, uh, which despite being basic has some advanced hardware. We will talk about this in the following slides. Uh, in this slide uh, and in one that follows, uh, we wanted to introduce uh, some cases that caught our attention. For example, of all the companies that have a basic ICT adoption level, 28% of them do not have a web page. 
And that percentage uh, decreases to 14%, although the surprising thing is that continues existing in companies with a medium ICT adoption level. In other words, something that could be considered as very basic, like a web page, is not possessed by a significant percentage of companies qualified as basic and medium. To conclude with the pilot test, in some cases of companies classified as basic, as we said before, we have found that they have at least one industry uh, 4.0 company. They have at least one of the driver technologies of industry 4.0. This could indicate that even with a basic level of development, some industries uh, decide to go towards a technological transformation. Then, as we can read in the slide, in many cases of personal conducted surveys, uh, we observe that there are many companies that do not have knowledge of the ICT's universe in which they could have access, and some of them did not even know the term industry 4.0. Uh, well, there are some actions uh, considered for continuous improvement. Uh, one of them is a check with certain periodicity if the evaluations uh, proposed in the matrix table are maintained or perhaps their status has changed. To give an example, at the time of making this presentation, 3D printers uh, are considered an advanced element, uh, although probably within a few years uh, they will be basic elements or medium elements. Uh, of use in the industry. We should also evaluate uh, additions, cancellations or modifications of the current variables. To cite an example, in the present survey model, uh, the option of NAS disks and SAN disk has already been left aside and we uh, also only speak about shared disks. Uh, we, re we realize that it doesn't make sense to be so specific. And some other thing, for example, is put more emphasis on ICTs that are being developed now that are moving towards 4.0. We are thinking that it could be a fourth level because we have three levels up to now, basic, uh, medium and advanced. It could be a fourth level or it could, it could be a subset of the third level. Alicia, Alicia Mon and myself have written a book in which I explain all of this uh, with much more detail. Uh, the book can be downloaded for free from the website mentioned above. Unfortunately, it's only in Spanish so far, but we don't have any problem to help with the translation. In fact, it would be a pleasure. Uh, as this model could be exported anywhere, we are presently working in a network um, with several universities, and all of them are in Latin America. Uh, therefore, uh, it was okay with the Spanish version up to now. Well, once again, thank you very much for taking the, list, the time to listen for this conference. And there is my email in case you want to keep in touch. Hmm? I think it was great with the time. <laughs> yes, you are great. Uh, thank right. you for your nice and clear presentation. It is very um, nice tool. And um, I wonder if there are some questions from audience any question, please uh, raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Check, check if there are some hands. Well, anyway, oh. I have provided this email so uh, we can we can talk uh, without any kind of problem uh, changing. Yes, but the ratio, how did you uh, assign the weight in the matrix? Uh, the weight, well, as I told you, uh, we um, there, there was uh, like um, with general discussions in the research group and then uh, when we assign this um, this um, this value, uh, we double check these uh, values with uh, some experts. Maybe you can use uh, a multi criteria method to weight the to assign the weight. For, yes, for example, uh, I don't know if you know analytic hierarchy process. Uh, maybe it, it is uh, uh, at a, it could be a, um, a different uh, uh, way to, to assign uh, the weight. And I yes. think that your, your tool is very nice and maybe uh,
could be interesting to spread all over uh, uh, the world, not only in Argentina. Yes, well, this is this is the idea uh, that we have, and and this is the way. Uh, this is the reason for uh, we thank you very much uh, for giving us the opportunity of uh, making this presentation in an international event. Uh, yes, it can be exported uh, wherever. As I told you before, uh, we are only using it uh, or uh, um, 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 using this uh, tool in some universities in Latin America, but um, which in reality is more or less the same as uh, the one yes. we have in Argentina. But yes, it can be exported. In fact, uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, try to, to speak too much, but uh, one of the continuous improvement uh, is uh, to uh, adapt this uh, model to uh, different uh, contexts and different uh, industries because uh, perhaps uh, we have some variable that applies to one a branch of industry, but not to another one. So uh, yeah. yes, we are in the beginning and, and we are uh, ready to, to work with whoever wants. Very, mm -hmm. very nice. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you thank very much you. to you and to all of you. Mm -hmm. uh, if there are no questions, we can move towards the last presentation. Um, the presenter is uh, Simone Gapparoli from Italy. Hi, Simone. Hi. And the title of the presentation is Architecture for Data Acquisition in Research and Teaching Laboratories. You can sp spread your slide. OK, can and you see? And you can, can start. You see the yes, so we can see. OK, perfect. So. OK, so. Uh, let's start. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Simone Galparoli and I will present our research uh, work about an architecture for data acquisition in research and teaching laboratories. Uh, first, as a brief introduction, we are, of course, in the in the paradigm of Industry 4.0, in which new paradigms and new industrial innovation are rising continuously. This leads uh, to the need of several research and and uh, several technology transfers product project this because uh, the uh, company needs uh, to test these new paradigms and to uh, to have some proof of concept some demonstrator and some validator for this kind of new technological and uh, paradigms advancement the problem with lots of this uh, project is that each project requires to start from from scratch and from uh, data acquisition and we heard also in uh, one of the previous presentation that this is a task that takes lots of time uh, even when the project is not uh, focused on this uh, scratch aspect this data acquisition aspect but is focused on more advanced research there is the the data acquisition and the building uh, the the data acquisition architecture is something that uh, it's uh, always present and takes uh, usually lots of effort so from here uh, we start with our research in order to design develop and document an architecture that can be used for industrial data acquisition and that is specifically uh, designed for laboratory environments that try to address the above stated criticalities with uh, some additional requirements we state for this specific architecture and that we think can be quite uh, interesting. The architecture we want to build an architecture that uh, first of all is a uh, uh, service 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 oriented so each inside the architecture is provided as a service by uh, a different module that takes care of that specific uh, uh, that specific uh, functionalities and this allows to develop also a distributed architecture and this is very useful in terms of uh, easiness of maintainability of this architecture of scalability of the architecture itself and the addition of new functionalities that can be added inside the environment without changing what already is in place the last characteristic we the last requirement we state is that the architecture should be self-documented which means basically that a new user that approach this uh, this architecture uh, should be able to find inside of it all the information that are needed in order to access the service provided by the architecture itself so we start by identifying some core functionalities that we want to be present and then from core functionality we uh, we state some core modules that uh, that will be the core module for this architecture and that are the connector and orchestrator topic manager static database and the middleware 
The connector is, of course, let's say the entry point in the architecture, and it takes care of the data acquisition from sources, so from digital uh, cyber physical systems on the floor, and that uh, brings those data inside the middleware. It's clear that a connector possesses strict performance requirements because it needs to read the data and publish it at least as fast as they are generated. So in this uh, in this direction, we we reduce the number of operations that a connector needs to to perform to the minimum number, uh, the minimum set that is needed just to grant the service that the connector the connector needs to uh, to perform. Then an additional uh, an additional uh, focus has been on the uh, on the definition of a structure for the connector that allows to parallelize and distribute multiple connection uh, in, in in different hardware inside the same environment with some orchestration between them. Then we have uh, another module, which is the topic manager. The topic manager's task is to create a specific communication channel for each of the users that access the architecture and provide to that user a subset of the data, only the data that the user need in a, in a way that is specifically formatted accordingly to the user requirement. So each user receive a specific communication on a specific channel. Then we develop the architecture following uh, the uh, middleware based model, which is uh, uh, quite a uh, uh, quite a uh, growing standard in industry 4.0 and the presence of a middleware in the architecture ensure data accessibility, data uniformity and the common data model between all the modules, then provide the persistence and guarantees again the loss of data in the information flow and then enable the communication between different modules and also the service discovery and all the services are managed through the middleware. Then we have the orchestrator, which is the fourth module and basically provided the entry point for the user. So it publishes all the services that, is, that are intended to be visible and accessible for the external users. Together with these high level services, it also perform internal orchestration, which means that it calls all the internal services for the internal modules in the architecture that are needed to establish the correct information flow for the user, then perform some garbage collection in order to remove those information flows that are no more needed uh, because user do not use it anymore, and then performs what we call ontological translation. Basically, it access the last component which is the ontological the static database and provide to all the modules inside the architecture all the information about the context in which the architecture is running in and that are needed for that specific uh, module to to perform is uh, its function and to provide its service so we talk about the static database and the static database address the self-documentation requirements of the architecture. So it is a database which um, which main purposes is to model the context and uh, in which the architecture is running and all the asset the architecture is in relation with. And so you can model inside this database asset signals and properties and uh, it provides those information to to final destination. One destination is the final user that can use the static database to gain awareness on uh, which is the environment he is dealing with. For example, get the complete list of the sensor presence in a specific asset or and provide those information also to the internal module of the architecture that need, for example, to know uh, the address of the MQTT server or the OPC way server on which some specific data uh, are published by the asset. Once the core module has been defined here in the picture, you can see the, the core interaction between the model inside the uh, architecture, so the interaction between the internal top modules. And as you can see, it, it can be intended basically as some data streams that are enabled as answers to some specific service request. 
after uh, completing the design, uh, the design phase, we start with the implementation of a reference architect of reference uh, modules, and basically, uh, basically we uh, start by uh, choosing the middleware for this kind of uh, architecture, and we uh, select Apache Kafka, which is a data stream platform that, in this case, fits perfectly with the need of have uh, data stream inside the architecture, but also the service request and the service response are managed through the architecture to the middleware itself, of course. Then we develop two reference connector, the one developed in Python for MQTT, uh, to, so to connect with MQTT servers, and then a second uh, connector developed specifically for the OPC UA servers that is developed in Golang because with this connector, we want to stress the focus on the possibility of have concurrent programming and so parallelization of, of tasks inside the connector because the connector, as we mentioned, is a performance critical element. Then we develop the orchestrator again in Python and the topic manager in which we have still uh, more or less the same uh, performance constraint that the connector again in Golang. As a, at the end, we, we choose Orient DB uh, as a static database because its internal uh, object oriented uh, structure fits perfectly with the, the information model we developed for the static database itself. Then we come to the test phase, and the test phase uh, has been performed into two different scenarios. The first one is our laboratory, which is the Industry 4.0 laboratory at Polytechnic Milano. In this laboratory, we have uh, some industrial asset providing uh, 624 OPC way signal divided into 14 server plus two MQTT signals uh, referring to the same servers. And inside this uh, test case, we uh, we work with the 10 Hertz signals publication frequency inside of the architecture. Then since we want to test the architecture also in a context which is external to our laboratory. We go to uh, Balance System, which is a company here in the north of Italy, and they provide us the BMK6, which is a machine for automatic uh, high production volume balancing for rotating masses in electric motors, so a real uh, industry, so an industrial asset used in, in, in production. Then uh, this machine provides uh, signals for monitoring in real time the power consumption of the three main motors which are present in, uh, in the machine and the pneumatic air flow, which is another critical component of this machine. Then all these this, uh, this, all these uh, sensors are provided as 10 Hertz MQTT uh, signals. So perform two different kind of tests. In, uh, in order to in order to test the architecture, the first test were the functional test in which we try to understand and to to state if uh, all the requirements we have for uh, for our architecture, all the requirements we state at the beginning of the design phase were met from the architecture in terms of function it provides, and then we switch to some performance test to to try to to state the level of performance we can expect from from such a similar architecture and we perform two different kind of tests. The first is let's say a standard test in which we acquire all the sensors present in the environment, so in the lab or on the machine from a single user and so provide the, the data to a single user or single application. And then we perform some stress tests, increasing the number of users querying the data in, uh, in parallel, uh, starting from 10 users up to 80. The two parameters we mainly consider in order to evaluate the performance of the architecture in those uh, in those scenarios were the delta between messages provided to, to the user and the latency between the data generation in the cyber physical system and the message reception from the user, so the time at which the data comes to the final user. Here you can see some of uh, the results of uh, some tests we, we performed. And here, if you look at the data in uh, we, we gather in balance system, you can see we have a delta of 0 0.1 seconds, which is perfectly aligned with the 10 Hertz signals we required for the user. And then we have a latency that is 0 0.06 uh, seconds, which is uh, low enough to enable cu current data gathering for from this application and real time uh, monitoring, for example, of uh, the machine in this case. In this graph, you can also see the results of one of the stress tests we performed, in which it's uh, clear that at the same point there are significant performance drop 
in the architecture. So uh, these performances drop starting when we have 78 uh, users connected uh, with the architecture, gathering all the, par the, the sensors uh, in parallel at the same time. So this is quite a good result because in a nominal condition for such similar um, uh, laboratory environment, we expect something like 10, 20 parallel uh, access to the data from different uh, research projects or different, uh, different, uh, uh, different users. So, as a conclusion, uh, the architecture, once implemented, accomplished its task under the policies that uh, under policies that are aligned with uh, our expectations, both in terms of provided functionality and also in terms of uh, performance. More in the details, an architecture like this can be used for a current time acquisition of data from industrial assets and so to build on top of this uh, uh, multiple different project, pro project that does not need to start from building again the data acquisition layer. Then, of course, represent an homogeneous data layer granting data consistency starting from not homogeneous data sources. In this example, in our test, we create MQTT and OPC way connector, but of course, we were talking before about also comma separated value, uh, comma separated value file, also uh, such similar uh, kind of, uh, of, uh, of data of data origin can be added inside of this architecture and then allow multiple users to access the same data sources without creating additional loads on the data source itself because because the uh, we decouple the data acquisition and the data distribution inside of the architecture and so uh, we can scale up the data distribution part without increasing the loads on the uh, asset and on the data generation uh, cyber physical system that of course cannot be distributed or scaled up. This brings me to the conclusion of this uh, presentation. Of course, if there are any questions or I will be happy to try to answer and uh, there is also my email. So if in the future there are some additional discussion, I'm always available for this. Simone, thank you for your presentation. Uh, also, your presentation was very nice and interesting. Uh, so, I am wondering if there was some question in the audience. Please uh, raise your hand. I don't see hand. But, uh, Simone, your, um, in Italy, your um, university is an excellence of and uh, you are like your perspective is a uh, lighthouse for uh, for us. But uh, in uh, your opinion, uh, what is uh, what could be the challenges for the next future? Maybe 5G. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, first of all, thanks for your question and thanks for the appreciation to our <laughs> university. Yeah, I think that uh, for sure there are uh, lots of technologies that are going to be uh, challenges and a uh, real important focus in the near future. Uh, 5G is of course one of, of these, but also other technologies discussed by in the previous presentation, like uh, for example, the augmented reality. What I think and that I would like to add is that uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, one additional aspect that needs always to be considered is that uh, we need to always have the complete vision in mind. So it's not a matter of just uh, increasing the performance or increasing the uh, results from one single technology, but the capability of build a complex ecosystem on top of this uh, single, uh, single uh, technology. So it's for sure a technological challenges that is a uh, it's uh, inside industry 4.0 but also the ability to to create new business model new vision new paradigms build it on top of this uh, of this technology that is going to be uh, one of the of the biggest next challenges in my opinion so the key words it's ecosystem maybe yeah i think that can be quite a good keyword to describe <laughs> okay Thank you for your uh, nice um, reply. And um, any other questions? It seems that there are no other questions. So please uh, turn, on, turn on your uh, camera I, um, for presenter so we can say hello together. And Horacio, Marcus, uh, and uh, Jan. 
and uh, thank you again uh, for your nice presentation. Uh, for me, it was a great pleasure to chair this session, to meet you, and, and because I have had the opportunity to learn something new, and that, that is the most important thing for my point of view. And uh, I hope that we can, uh, uh, that this session, it is an opportunity to keep um, to keep us in touch, to collaborate in the future, um, maybe for with Horacio, but also for Marco, with Marcus, Simone, that it is in Italy, and uh, 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 it is very closer to me, Simone, since we have the same scientific disciplinary uh, uh, in the university. Mm, and um, I would I spread my my mail with you and uh, so we can uh, keep in touch and uh, all, of course I thanks uh, all the staff Antonio Padvano for uh, his patience with uh, all of us and uh, I hope to see you in the close closing ceremony on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, so thanks again and join the conference. Thank you very much for you, Antonella. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.